<laughs> my name is Jason Wright. I'm a partner in our Washington, D.C. office, and it's a, a pleasure to be on with you all. Um, our goal for this uh, session is to exchange ideas. Um, there's a couple disclaimers on the board. Um, really what it means is uh, act in a way that adheres to our values as a firm and assuming adheres to your values as well. Not sharing competitive information, not sharing sensitive information, not taking anything said here as policy recommendations or anything, but, but a, an exchange of ideas uh, between, us, uh, between us here so that we can all move productively forward through the myriad challenges that face us all through this COVID-19 crisis. So I'm excited to hop in with y'all. Um, I'll, I'll start by talking about um, why we did this. Uh, you know, for the better part of a decade now, McKinsey has had a commitment to unlocking the power of diversity in the marketplace. Uh, and, and, and what that means in short is, you know, going back to our seminal study on diversity matters where we linked the long-term economic um, success of a company to the diverse uh, nature of its leadership, uh, to uh, women in the workplace, which we partner with um, leanin.org uh, on, to really highlight the experience of um, women professionals of all backgrounds and their challenges in navigating corporate America, but what happens when you're able to unlock and move those barriers. And this is in that tradition, and it's um, part of our commitment as a firm uh, to equity, not just in corporate America, but in society writ large. Um, and so we saw an opportunity here uh, to build on previous research that we'd done on the racial wealth gap, uh, to identify some of the drivers related to a disproportionate impact on Black Americans from COVID-19, and to lay out a framework so that all of us who care about this can start to really get practical about solutions. And so that's why we did this, and that's why we're here talking to you. And I've got some great colleagues on the line who are much smarter than me who are going to go, um, go into the details on all of this uh, with Aria sort of steering our ship. So I'll just I'll jump in here and say, um, so these are the, the eight authors of the article. Um, we have most of us on this morning, um, but we wanted to just make sure that we acknowledge all of the incredible work that went into, into the report. All right, so getting started. So COVID-19 is first and foremost a global humanitarian challenge. And, and we actually put a stake in the ground on that front just because you know, there's been a lot of conversation across both the health impact of the virus as well as the economic impact. Um, but we do just want to say that as a firm, we really think about this as you know, a, a question of lives first and foremost. Then of course, we do always want to go into the impact on livelihoods. Um, and so, as Jason said, sort of the goal here uh, is to exchange ideas. Um, our report, you know, wasn't just about sort of a static set of instructions. Obviously, the, the COVID crisis overall is changing so rapidly that that would not be possible. Um, but specifically to provide kind of a, a, a view on the most acute needs um, for Black Americans and initial ideas about how stakeholders might invest resources to uh, make positive change. And I think the last thing that I'll note is that some of these solutions aren't actually novel, um, but they are solutions that we think are um, even more ripe in the context of the pandemic because of the urgency that stakeholders across sectors are feeling to collaborate to get things done to improve uh, in the recovery. So as most of you have probably seen, the media coverage of the impact of COVID-19 on minorities has been extensive. I think just this morning, the daily article or the daily podcast from the New York Times um, covered the fact that it is hitting black communities at a disproportionate rate. We set out kind of early in March to start thinking about this question because we actually believed that, you know, this impact was probably predictable. Um, obviously, we know that Black communities have been disadvantaged by structural challenges for you know, centuries in this country, um, and that many of those compound to create kind of a perfect, terrible storm with regard to the coronavirus. And so we view it as McKinsey to kind of look at this picture in a structured, sort of fact-based way. Um, so that the conversation about solutions can actually become a more targeted and tailored one for our community. In addition, we think it's really important to think about sort of 
both how health and the economy kind of um, impact each other. And then in addition, kind of how place layers on to the impact of the virus on our community. Um, so we did a county by county analysis of multiple different factors across both lives and livelihoods. And we found that black Americans are almost twice as likely to live in places where if the contagion hits, the pandemic will cause outside disruption. Um, so just a note on how we did this analysis, we looked at five indicators, um, the comorbidity rate, uh, poverty rate, population density, percentage of residents with severe housing problems, and the number of hospital beds in a county. Um, and then we obviously looked at the populations of those counties, um, put them all into deciles and found that the kind of 10% of the population overall in those counties, 18% of black Americans live there. And so what we found is essentially black Americans are more likely to be sort of put into this vicious cycle of um, of being hit by the virus either on the lives or the livelihood side and then spiraling downwards because of that. So now we're going to go into more detail on kind of both the lives and livelihood side. Um, if you guys have questions as we talk through the health section, um, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll actually pause after that section and have a discussion then and then move into the economic section. Um, if not, we can also just take questions at the end. So as you guys uh, wish. Awesome. So now I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, Sam, who will take us through. If we can get to the next slide, I, I think when we talk about uh, the implications of COVID on black health, um, there are a multitude of systematic or uh, inequities that exist uh, for black Americans. You know, we can talk about issues of access to health care. We can talk about the ACA expansion um, that is not prevalent in, in the South, where 58% of um, Black Americans live. But as we take a step back, we wanted to apply it directly to COVID. So how are these inequities translating to a disproportionate share or impact on the Black American community? And there are three main things we're going to talk about today. I think one is about a higher risk of actually contracting COVID-19. Second is the access to testing so people know they have COVID-19 and can seek the appropriate care. And the third is just inherent risk and comorbidities that is very prevalent in the Black American community. So on the piece of higher risk of contracting COVID, you know, one thing we found very astonishing in, in the as we tried to pull together the report is the fact that 80%, 80% of Black Americans aren't able to work from home. So as we all sit working from our homes today, we must acknowledge that we have a privilege that others don't. So when you think about stay-at-home orders, for some folks, getting out means their livelihoods. So, you know, we have an overrepresentation of Black workers on the front line in healthcare, in retail, government services, you name it. So, the more you're out, and we, we know it's documented, you have a high risk of contracting COVID 19. Second is about actually getting tested. I know through last week or early this week, we've seen that as a black population, we represent about, you know, probably anywhere from 12 to 14 percent of the U.S. But overall, estimates right now point to close to 30 percent of COVID-19 deaths. That is clearly disproportionate. But what I actually would love to see is what percent of testing that is being done today are actually Black Americans. Because as we've, as of, you know, the publishing of this report, we identify that Black Americans are more likely to live in states that were below the median access testing. So this could actually be further exacerbated the more people get tested. And I think one thing that has been very challenging for everyone, and I think more so for Black Americans, has been access. 
In order to get tested for most states, I know there are executive orders coming in daily, but you need a referral to get tested. Now, as a Black American, you're less likely to have a primary care doctor. As we even know it, that you know, for most Black Americans, we have to leverage the emergency room, community health centers to be able to get access to care outpatient centers, and most of those have been closed. You're told only come to the emergency room if you know you have COVID. Well, for most Black Americans, how do I even know I have COVID with communication and getting the right information out there? So testing has been, uh, I would say, the Achilles heel to identifying the issue. So my hope is as we see more executive orders coming, we see more pop-up centers, uh, drive-throughs, we can expand testing and actually have direct focus on Black communities that are disadvantaged, going to meet us in our neighborhoods versus trying to get us to come out of our neighborhoods. And the third thing which has been documented for decades, I actually had a chance to read the 1985 report for then Secretary of Health, which commit was commissioned as probably one of the most extensive review of uh, health discrimination to the Black community. And as you can see, we're disproportionately have these COVID or morbid conditions, diabetes, hypertension, all linked to adverse impacts. So when you combine all these challenges, barriers, and health disparities that exist, we're you know 30% more likely. And I've seen numbers as recent as you know a few days ago that this could be upwards of 50%. I think these implications are the root cause issues, and we'll talk later about what are some of the solutions that we can bring to bear. And on the next slide, I know we, I mentioned earlier about you know, us contracting, Black Americans contracting uh, COVID-19 because we're essential workers. I mean, this is just very evident. If you look at nine of the 10 essential uh, high contact services, we're overrepresented in nine of the lowest wage jobs. So two things here. One is overrepresented, low paid, highly likely you don't have access to health care, or you don't have your you you don't you're uninsured or underinsured. And these are all issues that then impact how you're able to get care. But that said, you know, we've tried to lay out an initial view of what are immediate opportunities for stakeholders to take. We've seen examples in New York where there's a coalition with churches to get directly to these neighborhoods. But I think there are three things we've laid out. Let's make sure that we get equitable access to testing and care. Most Black Americans rely on Medicaid. And as we've seen, you know, in 2012, the Supreme Court ruling against the National Federation of Independent Business and uh, V. Sebelius made ACA an option for states. Now, through our research, you know, well documented, we found out that 17 states have not expanded for Medicaid. Now, it won't be a shocker that I tell you that those 17 states are in the southern region of the United States where 58% of African Americans live. So when you link that there, access to care is not there. So what we're at least putting forth for folks to consider is get testing in our neighborhoods, publish the data, not just death, but go upstream, how many people are actually being tested, and let's also expand enrollment periods for uninsured. Let's go from it being an option to creating an opportunity. We have choices that we can make today to help our black and brown brothers and sisters get access to testing and care. I think partnerships are gonna be very critical in making sure that we can get to our different communities. Community health workers are the bedrock of black and brown communities. We need to recruit more faith-based organizations because they are the pillars of our community. Their churches, their mosques, their synagogues can be used as areas and locations to test. And finally, when we talk about that, we are overrepresented in none of the lowest paying jobs. I know Jason and others are working with different organizations thinking through how do we bring about hazard pay for folks that are on the front line and bring some equity to it, provide benefits of life insurance, should things happen that families are taking care of? 
So these are just some of the initial thinking that we're putting together, but there's a long list of ideas and solutions that we need stakeholders to stack hands and make sure that we address the near-term need. And, and, and my colleagues will talk about the longer-term implications that we've been trying to build up for the last few years. Perfect, thanks, Aria. I think one of the things I'll just add before we jump into the livelihood side is that based on what Sam laid out and, and what Aria laid out in the intro, and you look at that map, that shows the counties um, and, and, the, and the likelihood of disparity based on all the different factors, especially those related to healthcare provision and underlying conditions, that, that our perspective is that this crisis was predictable. This crisis was predictable. Um, and it was not surprising because of those underlying conditions. And actually what we're about to jump into is that the roots of the racial wealth gap are the roots of this crisis. They are one and the same. They sink fully. So that map that Aria showed earlier we have another report that we did um, about a year ago that talked about the economic impact of the racial wealth gap and 1.5 trillion in GDP that's left on the table uh, by not having the same amount of median wealth between white and black families. The map that we had for that of the 16 states and areas where black folks are most centrally located maps almost perfectly over the other, especially in uh, the Midwest the uh, Northeast and uh, the rural South and the rural Southeast. And so there is, uh, th these things are not surprising. And so I think what, what JP is gonna take us into is something that's really important. And it's sort of our theory of action on this. And that is addressing the underlying issues of economic inequity would prevent something like this from happening in the future. So I just wanted to point that out as, as JP jumps in. Thanks Jason, no, it's exactly right. Um, and as Ari alluded to, while this is a public health crisis, there are and already have been great economic impacts, the likes of which we haven't seen in a generation, and actually the U.S. hasn't seen since the Great Depression. And so if we actually go to the next page, one of the things we wanted to do is really anchor the impacts of COVID on how we think about the wealth building journey. And so the journey is comprised of four kind of critical areas. The first is community context, and this is really about where you live, your fixed environment. So this impacts your ability to access public resources, to live in a place that has the social supports needed for you to succeed, to live in a place that has strong public investments in things like infrastructure. The next is family wealth. Now these are really about the actual assets you own. So whether it be ownership in a small business, your home, your investment portfolio, those are kind of the, the core areas of your family wealth. Thirdly, there's family income. Now this is really about the wages you receive from income from your work, which is often correlated with your educational background, your training, and your human capital development. And lastly, there's family savings. And this really refers to the, having the adequate financial resources and access to the financial system to protect your family income and your family wealth in a way that is allowing for you to then translate that wealth into generational um, access. Not surprisingly, before COVID-19, we knew that this, these are the four kind of primary causes of the racial wealth gap. And during a time when the US was facing its greatest economic expansion, the impact of just narrowing this gap by roughly 2030 was about $1.5 trillion. That's not even closing the gap, that's just narrowing as fast as we could based on what we've done historically. And so as we can imagine, given the, the disproportionate impact that we'll go into in a second, that COVID-19 is having on black Americans, it's likely that this gap is further and even bigger now today than it was pre-COVID. So as we think about each of those four areas, and starting on the top left of your screen, think about the community context here. We did a survey of nearly 10,000 US households and found that black communities are more likely to rely on public services that are increasingly difficult to access, particularly during the time of COVID. So if you think about things like public transportation, and as Sam alluded to, you know, black folks being more rely, relying on those services, both for work and to get around, and then as a result, being more exposed to the disease as well. Similarly, are more reliant on food assistance programs, and as states are facing fiscal pressures, these are exactly the types of things that are more likely to be uh, economically uh, constrained. Moving to the, the right, looking at family wealth, we looked at business ownership to really understand kind of what the impact might be. And not surprisingly, there, there are a couple core sectors in which 
the impact of COVID is disproportionately strong. Uh, those five are hospitality, retail, transportation, construction, and other services. So think personal care, barbershops, all the things that we are looking forward to getting back to once uh, the world reopens. Uh, what we found though is that in these five core sectors that are most vulnerable to economic disruption as a result of COVID, black owned businesses, 40% of their revenues come from these five core sectors relative to 25% of white owned businesses. So from a long-term economic impact on business ownership and the wealth created there, black folks are disproportionately impacted on, on that end. Moving down to the bottom right, we then looked at family wealth. Um, and in this pandemic, what we found is more black Americans in that survey saw the pandemic as a major threat to their personal financial health. What is interesting in this is a large part of the challenge with COVID is as the economy shuts down, it is not that the challenge is really the, the gap in between I'm no longer working to, I can, I can kind of go back to work and have access to the capital I need to pay my rent, pay for my student loans, all of those things. And what we know to be true even before COVID is that Black Americans are less likely to have access to credit. So as one example, nearly a third of Black Americans actually don't have a credit card uh, compared to about 15% of white Americans. And so from the ability to actually have the liquidity to bridge the gap that is kind of the stay at home order and COVID near term economic disruption, Black folks are at a disproportionate advantage, disadvantage there. And then lastly, we looked at family uh, income. And what we did here was actually looking through about 800 occupations, looked at what is the impact of the stay at home orders in terms of the criticality of the job itself, how much in contact the job requires you to be with other folks such that those are more at risk of being furloughed or laid off. And we found that roughly 40% of all jobs for Black Americans, about 7 million jobs in the U.S. are vulnerable for furlough or layoff relative to about 34% for white Americans. So that's the kind of the grim reality, but we, we also wanted to then think about what are some of the solutions, particularly that public and social sector leaders could be thinking about as they think about tackling some of these challenges to ensure that the wealth gap doesn't widen, but in fact that Black Americans are able to come out of the COVID-19 kind of lockdown in a better and more sustainable place. So we use the similar co co construct to understand kind of within each of these wealth building stages, what could um, players do to be thinking about wealth building? So on the community context side, this is really about how do we ensure that black Americans and black families have the social support services they need that are even more important than ever in light of COVID, but also thinking about things that are critical community assets like broadband access. We've had many conversations with states and with residents across the US on the ability to work from home, to learn remotely, uh, is really to even connect with their family on Skype or WebEx. If you don't have internet access, it becomes both increasingly difficult to do those things successfully, uh, both from an employment, education, and just social standpoint. So think about things like the digital divide. There are some states that are doing some really interesting partnerships with big carriers or states are even doing things like using school buses to drive to neighborhoods that don't have uh, public wi-fi and using that as a hotspot. on the family wealth side this is really about protecting wealth deterioration so things like ensuring um, more terms on foreclosures and evictions are a start but even thinking about particularly from the business ownership standpoint the federal government is releasing unprecedented amounts of capital, how do we ensure at the state and local level that black businesses are getting access to their fair share of, of those resources? Uh, and how do we ensure that we are connecting and targeting those funds as, as best we can to ensure that they have access? On family savings, this is really again about liquidity and access to capital. So how do we ensure things like cash assistance or in-kind liquidity to ensure that black Americans have kind of that especially in the near term, the critical capital needed to uh, bridge this divide. And then on the family income side, this is where I think Jason alluded to it earlier, but things like paid family sick leave, paid uh, sick and family become increasingly important, as does hazard pay. Um, but more long term thinking about 40% of black American jobs are vulnerable to COVID. 
we're also seeing on the private sector side, this is a time when many are thinking about advancing the future of work and their investments in automation. Uh, I think this crisis has given folks a bit of a preview to what the future might look like, uh, in which technology enables us to do more, but also with less people. And so how do we ensure that Black Americans are able to reskill, upskill, and be able to take advantage of some of those new opportunities, uh, particularly as investments in the future of work are accelerated? What really excites me about the, the, the framework on that page is just a couple of things I'll, I'll point out to you all, is that I see on here, several new opportunities for dynamic public-private partnerships. So as the crass capitalist on the line, there are, there are ways that uh, government and private sector can link arms in a new way that's both profitable for businesses, but needs the coordination, the insight, the influence of government to actually pull off. So one of the things in community wealth that's in the parenthetical here around digital infrastructure, and JP started to highlight it, you know, one is busing in Wi-Fi. But there is, there is this, this broadband issue is a triple whammy to the black community in COVID. Um, only 30, I think 36% of black households don't have access to reliable Wi-Fi or a personal computer compared to 20% of white households compared to 11% of Asian American households. What that means is when you're working from home, you're not doing it as well. You're more likely to have reduced hours. It means your kids aren't finishing school, whether it's K-12 or higher education, which is really important. And then you're not accessing telemedicine. You're not actually keep up being able to keep up with whether it's COVID symptoms or underlying condition. And so it's a triple whammy. But what is the opportunity for the government to provide incentives to coordinate the right stakeholders so that a telecommunications partner goes and invests in the digital infrastructure that's there not just now to help with COVID, but in the longer term, uh, increases the economic viability of neighborhoods that just didn't have that same ability because they were sort of dark. If we had a Wi-Fi grid, they were dark. And, and then on family savings, a great example here, and we're talking to uh, companies about this, is we, I think a lot of folks have talked about the topic of algorithmic justice. And that is that the algorithms that have been used to assess credit and uh, especially in financial services have been trained on data sets that might have institutional bias built into them. Now is the opportunity for companies along with government provocation and social sector provocation to begin to look at alternative ways of assessing credit. Instead of looking at the traditional measures, start looking at whether or not someone's paid their light bill. That is a reliable measure of whether somebody has the financial means uh, to have access to credit where liquidity is really important. And so I I'd encourage folks on the line to think about <clears throat> those vectors where the private sector and its incentives to make money during this can actually drive an outsized proportion of outcomes on your behalf with your prodding and your shaping. The last thing we wanted to highlight before we open the floor up to questions was, as we think about both lives and livelihoods, there are some cross cutting themes and enablers that we find are really important. Uh, and having this conversation with state and uh, social sector partners, we found that there are four that kind of really bubble to the top. The first is really around data. How do we ensure that we actually know and are collecting the information needed to make good decisions, uh, both on the disproportionate impact on health? And so things like testing are actually really important. How many folks are getting tested, but also looking at the economic impact and being able to geo-target and locate where the need is actually greatest in helping you deploy your assets. The second is really around how do you ensure that the decision making and governance of these choices is really equitable. And so there are a couple organizations and states that are thinking about things like equity teams, equity councils, to ensure that the resources they're deploying have a lens of how will this impact black and brown communities at the forefront as opposed to an afterthought. The third is really committing to kind of making these investments and having an equitable response. Uh, I think we find a lot of times that the public declaration of we are supportive and committed to this then allows residents to hold governments and social sector organizations to account uh, and provides the catalyst needed to ensure that those investments are actually deployed in the ways that are most helpful. And then lastly, and Sam alluded to this a bit in the, the health piece, is ensuring that organizations that are community-led uh, and are in these different uh, neighborhoods are empowered and have the resources to support uh, black Americans, whether it be churches, social sector organizations, um, higher education institutions, 
ensuring that there are the resources needed that they have the capacity to support uh, what is areas of some of the greatest need in the U.S. So those are some of the, the, the fundamental kind of areas you wanted to talk through. Um, I guess I had a wonder if there's any questions from the group, but if not, I have a question I would love to throw out there and just what are the organizations, the folks on the phone, what are you kind of thinking about brainstorming, doing already um, to really target your efforts towards black and brown communities or what has been top of mind? We'd love to hear a bit more about kind of what you guys are thinking about. That's great. I can jump in, JP. Um, and and to, to the audience, feel free to put questions in the chat um, and then we'll read them out. Um, so I've been thinking about this from kind of like a one bucket is my like personal life and then another bucket is my professional life um, in terms of sort of what I can do. Um, and I think on the personal side, um, one of the big things is just like anytime I order either food or gifts or anything like that. I'm thinking about how to make sure that I'm patronizing black businesses. Um, um, and then obviously, secondly, just um, trying to be, trying to check in with my community as much as possible, friends, family. Um, but I think, you know, it, there's just so much grief right now, um, in particular, given the uncertainty, but also the fact that most of us have either know someone or have felt it themselves of someone who's been uh, very adversely impacted by COVID. And so um, just trying to amp up my kind of, um, you know, capacity to check in on the people I love. Um, and then on the professional side, um, you know, I, I think that all of us have an ability to help push our companies, our foundations, our agencies um, to step into this this in particular this issue with regard to the crisis in a more kind of um, meaningful and public way obviously working on this report uh, was part of that for us um, but i think that goes back to the third thing on this slide which is that you know the more people are publicly talking about this issue the more normal it becomes the more that becomes a snowball that gets bigger and bigger um, and makes it easier for like big organizations to actually incorporate this work into their broader responses. And I think that then, then goes to the second thing on this page, which is that, you know, if there are people within those organizations who are championing, it's like the recovery efforts from an equity perspective and that they are empowered and embedded in the broader kind of recovery and response teams, um, that can be actually a really powerful one too, to make sure that uh, organizations and institutions are doing everything that they can uh, to be a part of the solution. I see we got a question on public health departments, which I think is a really good one. Do you, um, yeah. you want to take, do you want us to start taking those, Aria? Yeah, sounds Your good. Thoughts. So, so yeah. the question is, since public health departments and local governments are already stretched so thin, do you have suggestions as to how they can build these suggestions into their current strategies in ways that either use available resources efficiently or other ideas? Um, so maybe Sam, do you want to take that from the health side and JP from the economic side? Yeah, happy to. You know, so I think there's an opportunity. Uh, one is helping public health departments think through what are the most critical elements to measure. I've had the opportunity to actually spend time talking to a few public health uh, leaders across different states, and I think for some of them is like one is I haven't even had the opportunity to think through what that right dashboard looks like or what that right uh, KPI or you know, key performance indicator looks like. So I think there's a first step is like, in order to act, you must first understand what problem you're trying to solve. And I think inherently we get it, but I think my, my view is the first step is, is the, let's try to help our public health officials lay out that case, you know, my thing is there's always a moral imperative. And I think that's where we come at it from most of the time, but the data can help us lay out the economic imperative. Um, as an example, if I think about, you know, you pick your, pick any state, because I, I don't want to name a state here, but pick any state, when you look at health challenges, I think most states 
of public health leaders know where those hotspots are, but have not elevated it to the key decision makers to make the request of what else we need to do. So my, my view is first, let's, let's help our public health officials drive standardization and data and reporting to be able to elevate some of these issues. As you can see, reporting on black, brown, vulnerable populations' lives as part of COVID-19, we've elevated this issue. And so that would be my initial piece. I know the groups are stretched, but first helping to lay out that case and showing some of the data elements could elevate action uh, from state and local government. Awesome. JP, you want to add anything? No, it's, it's a great uh, point, Sam. I was actually thinking that a lot of the same lines, particularly for organizations that are stretched in. The first thing that's really important is understanding the, the scale and scope of the problem. And so this idea of data collection and understanding kind of where you stand is really important. Some of the conversations that we've been having with uh, both state and local governments are really around while things are stretched thin and given the kind of slowdown of economic activity, states are not getting sales tax, not getting business income tax, and so we're feeling that fiscal pressure for sure. What are the ways that we can think about current existing programs and prioritizing them differently? So having kind of the mental muscle and the flexibility to say, here's what we usually spend and what we typically spend. Are there ways that we can be creative and fundamentally changing how different programs are structured and either repositioning them to support where we know there are targeted problems now uh, that it will really impact folks in a meaningful way? And so I think this idea of both data, but then also being creative in how do you think about what you already have today and prioritize effectively uh, that is response to that data, we, we found to be pretty helpful. I was thinking about this resource constraint thing for health networks along three dimensions. And I think I have a little bit of perspective on two of them, but the third, I'm not sure about sort of above my pay grade. But there's a, there's a constraint on the actual physical capital. So like, do you have enough space? Are there enough beds? Like that's one part of being overwhelmed is the allocation, right? And Sam talked about, it. if you have better data, we can do better allocation, et cetera. But there is a stopgap opportunity. There are facilities in communities of color that have the ability to do pop-up testing, to uh, provide triage services, churches, YMCAs, YWCAs, boys and girls clubs, the stuff that is the root and connectivity within our communities can actually be leveraged to deliver essential services at this time. And not just on the healthcare side, on uh, the food and nutrition side, on other essential services. So there is a way, there's, there's actually assets that exist within the black community ecosystem that can be leveraged if governments, healthcare agencies and others are willing to engage with black led organizations, which is one of our important theories of action work with Black-led organizations that have trust and have cap cultural capital within communities, as well as this physical capital to deliver some of those things. That's one. I think secondarily, there is a constraint around skills and capabilities. So you, there's physical space, and then there's like the people to do the work. Uh, this is not, this doesn't happen as quickly, but we don't know how long COVID is gonna be around. You know, my Lord, I hope it is not around much longer. I hope we have a vaccine and all of that. But if this is a longer term thing, if there is a resurgence, there's an opportunity now to invest heavily in building the cadre of community health workers within communities of color across the country. Uh, start with those trainings now. And in, in a couple months, you're going to have a new set of people that can deliver some measure of these healthcare services at the tip of the spear within these communities, maybe even leveraging these facilities. And then over the long term, you build a set of capability that exists in vulnerable populations that could have outsized impact in helping black folks never be in this situation again, right? So those are, those are the couple things. I think there's a third thing on like actual you know, cash, like are y'all constrained around cash and finances? I don't know how to help with that one. And I can't, you know, I can't, don't do tax codes and stuff like that, I don't know. But, um, but with those other two, I think there are some creative things and probably you all who are much smarter than me can think of other things as well in that vein. That was great. Thanks, Jason. Um, another question came in around the fact that there will be a lot of money spent in getting our economy going, in particular around government contracts. Um, so uh, can we share our thoughts on how to make sure that we're positioned in minority companies and, and minorities in general, uh, that we benefit from those contracts? 
Jason, you want to take it? Yeah, sure. I'll start there. Um, so on this one, uh, I get a little I get a little ornery on this one. There, there are black businesses that some are at scale and quite capable, um, and there are resources that exist that let you know where they are. The National Minority Supplier Diversity Council. Um, gosh, I'm forgetting the other one. It's um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting uh, the name of her organization. But there are several folks that you know, is literally. <laughs> A list. You know, there was jokes back in the day on political campaigns about binders of women. There are binders of <laughs> black businesses that exist for people to look through uh, and to find, you know, uh, partners that can really drive some of the outcomes uh, that you're looking for. So I think, you know, one is raising uh, to the level of decision makers uh, these sort of things. I think there's also something that can be done outside in. Um, in partnership with forward thinking corporate leaders, and that is for them to start showing um, publicly displaying what they are doing in terms of the business they send through their supplier networks, especially right now in light of COVID. So for the areas that are booming in light of COVID, medical distribution, um, uh, bespoke cleaning services, things like that, especially as, as folks move to reopening, what number, what amount of those contracts are going to black or brown businesses? And being transparent about that could stoke a move um, in many others. Um, I think the other opportunity here is for companies to look at this as a time to invest in and in growing not just their near term pipeline of diverse businesses, but their longer term pipeline. So if you've got a call it a subscale black business uh, that could support you on uh, construction and capital services, and you've got some need right now um, to do some small work around uh, preparing for reopening, uh, social distancing in the workplace. You've got to change around office space, et cetera. So you've got you know, small scale um, uh, renovation work to do. You hire that business, you get to understand their capabilities, and then you start to actually build their capabilities and tailor their offering to you going forward as a leader. And this is something where I think you as government leaders can have those conversations, can raise the awareness of the existence of some of these businesses to private sector leaders, and then can, can really drive the narrative um, and cheerlead behind companies that are doing this well. I, those are the couple things that popped to mind for me um, around this, maybe others. Um, JP, Aria, feel free to hop in. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in really quickly just to add, you know, this point about fair share is a really important one, not just for contracts, but also for government relief funding. Um, obviously, one of the things that we've seen is that um, as soon as, as, so for example, the PVP was released, um, there were some places in which um, businesses from minority parts of town, just because that's the way that the data is normally tracked, um, didn't get access to any of that funding. And so um, that just goes back to our first enabler on this list, which is actually prioritizing the collection of data and making sure that the processes in which people are applying and then get approved for these funding are equitable and making sure that everyone has equal access uh, to the funds. I think one longer term thing too, insofar as um, you as public sector leaders are involved with incubating black businesses, because that is, uh, we got a couple more questions. I shouldn't spend too much time on it. I see the questions are piling up. But um, uh, insofar as your invested in helping to start incubate and grow them as part of your public services as part of you contracting with them over time i think there's also an opportunity to do a bit of market making here and that is to look at black entrepreneurs go to historically black colleges and universities go to your high performing um, inner city high schools and find top black talent and there is a way uh, in conjunction with vc firms and others to direct great black talent into the industries where there will be growth. It might not be the sexiest thing in the world. You know, I, I mentioned, you know, construction um, and engineering services. Like, that is going to be growing, uh, both now and especially on the back end of COVID. If we had more black businesses in that space that could do the work you all are looking for at scale, that would be a remarkable thing. How can we actually guide our folks into those arenas versus the others where we might, where we might gather? We've talked about having overrepresentation in retail hospitality and leisure. It sounds like we probably don't need more there. <laughs> we probably don't need more there. Are there other spaces where we can be so that the actual um, diversification 
of the full portfolio of black businesses in the economy is a bit more balanced. That's a, that's a big idea. I don't know how we get under that, um, but I, I think there's probably a role for you all to play. Yeah, great. Um, so another question, so, I, so this question is, I like the suggestion regarding national goals, um, although it seems unrealistic given the current climate. How can we help at other levels to influence and facilitate public disclosure related uh, regarding equity? Are there public forums where this could be added? JP, you want to take this? Yeah, happy to Aria. I think on the economic development side, at least a lot of what we're seeing is exactly that. And you're exactly right. A lot of the changes happening at the local level. And so in actually their reopen and recovery plans, what we're seeing is real engagement with uh, residents and actually bringing resident voices to get a sense of what some of these goals might look like. And so we're seeing it from a, a standpoint more of local governments listening to what people are dealing with and also then setting standards to say, here's where we want to get to in a, here's what an equitable recovery would look like for us over the next three to five years. And so we're seeing some of that at the kind of local level. And a lot of it is being driven by surveys, virtual forums, virtual um, kind of focus groups in which people are getting that input. The, the point I will say, though, is that I think you're right. Currently, the current climate may be difficult nationally, but there are, you know, opportunities for local organizations. I think one of the things that we've seen is COVID has made it very clear that states really matter and they have actually quite a bit of power locally. And so how they set their agenda, the national voices they give to certain issues actually is quite important. So from the standpoint of even if we aren't doing something federal, I think states have a, a really unique position to bubble up some of these important issues and to set a standard that other governors and local leaders will follow that will hopefully get us to a national standard. I agree. If I can add one point there, I do think, you know, on the healthcare side, it's, 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 you know, states can do it. I think to JP's point, states have a lot of followers. You know, if I look at Medicaid contracts that states give to MCOs, you know, can you start to bring in things around population health and managing, you know, the, the black community, you know, getting to see data around, do, are, are you spending more on preventative care as a provider or are you spending more on end of life? And we know like a lot of dollars are spent on end of life and we need those dollars shifted to preventative care. So you can start to build in local metrics as you're awarding contracts to MCOs and start to bring some transparency and holding uh, these private organizations accountable. And I think even as an employer, you know, if, if you're a big retailer in the country and you're, you, you have, you know, a health insurer managing your book as an ASO, you should be seeing data on like, how is my black population doing? Right, because if those workers are not showing up to work, absent, absenteeism, you no, know, it's not just a direct healthcare dollar. They're indirect impact to the economy if your workers don't show up. So I think there is some accountability there of demanding, you know, population health information around the, the people that work for and with you. And at the state government also, if you're giving contracts, putting in some, you know, agreements and measurements to see how effective are these organizations that are delivering care for you. So that, that's just, I think, a few comments on the health side. Great, yeah. Oh, one more question. So a big equity issue um, is around reduced access to higher education for black students. Um, public universities are already predicting up to 50% attrition in first-gen college students. So how can we help influence this important lever? Jason, you want to kick that off? Yeah, yeah. We could do a whole webinar on this one. Uh, in fact, I'm jumping to a call right after this uh, at the top of the hour with the historically black college on this topic, enrollment, re-enrollment, and retention. Um, I didn't know the number was that high, actually, so that's news to me that they're, that there's predicting 50% 50, 50 attrition. Actually, what a lot of my clients are seeing is that deposits are still coming in for new students. Deposits are still coming in for next year, but they just feel less certain about it. But that, that's a great data point. If you don't mind letting us know where you found it, that'd be super helpful to me personally. Um, uh, that, that said, I, I think there are a couple things that can be done. When we're talking about first generation students, we're talking about probably Pell eligible. And the, and the main reason for uh, a higher attrition rate would be the economic uh, status of the family. 
and what is happening because of what's happening in the economy around COVID, uh, especially in those families, um, and a need to be a support to the family, either from a health or lively, lives or livelihood standpoint, and needing to be closer um, and saying, well, I'm going to stay home, I'm going to work, and I'm going to you know, play my role in helping us get through this. Uh, there's also the concern that an online environment is not going to be ideal um, for them. Uh, because working from home, whether I have it's a broadband access, I'm going to have additional responsibilities, or I really needed the supports of campus via counselors or others to be successful. Um, and, that, and that's what really made the experience for me. That's a big concern for HBCUs, right? Uh, there are a few things that can be done. Number one, and the simplest one, is proactive communication from universities about the levers and, and, um, and options that they have for students to navigate this time. It is very easy for people to say, we're going to keep you admitted. You can take a break and you can come back in the winter. It is very easy to do that, especially considering most first generation students are going to be mostly on scholarship anyway. The financial hit to universities is not going to be that high. It's not actually going to be that high on a relative basis uh, compared to full tuition paying students. So there's an opportunity to say, if you need this, take it and we will be here with open arms and still provide them access to the mental health, to the student life services that are being provided, most likely online for many of these institutions uh, in the fall anyway. So, so that's number one, and that's the most pragmatic uh, solution. I think there are a set of other things that can be done as well. Uh, I think one of the things that many of the universities that I'm working with are really thinking about is how do they actually track and understand the progression, satisfaction, the overall comprehensive state of well-being of their most at-risk students. Companies do this all the time. You might do this at your, in your organizations in terms of organizational health, but higher ed has been um, uh, behind the ball in doing a simple pulse survey. What are the key questions that will let you know how a student is doing? What are the leading indicators via analytics of attrition? And how do we ask questions that give us two, three, four months lead time on when that might happen versus now, versus reacting to it in the moment. And those are capabilities that all these institutions need, but especially those that are trying to serve underserved uh, students, historically underserved students, and uh, helping organizations to build those capabilities is really important. So I think where the government and other public and social sector leaders can play a role is number one, ensuring these institutions get the right amount of resources. This is equity at its finest. Those institutions that are serving the students with the greatest need should get the disproportionate share of resources that are coming through whatever types of funding are coming down. I don't know how to direct that. I don't know how to play that game. Y'all do. And it, I think uh, whatever wizardry you have to direct resources in an equitable fashion is number one and critically important. Uh, these institutions will make good use of it, whether it's direct support to students or new institutional investments. Um, I think uh, number two, is again making it easy for companies to invest in some of the capabilities that are needed as some of these schools transition to online is there a way to use the overlap with opportunity zone funding and other things for uh, for to encourage the private sector to make investments in a new technological infrastructure or uh, uh, a a new uh, 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 retail or student services uh, provision that's needed on campus in light of COVID, like you know, like a like what what do you call it, like a cleaning center or whatever it is, like what are the types of things that you could incentivize now by saying, hey, by the way, there's a tax break for this, we will provide incentives um, around these institutions that are in our jurisdictions. So uh, that that's the short answer. We could talk about this uh, a million times over, but uh, hopefully that gets your brain moving on it. Yeah, thanks, Jason. And and I know we're all, all out of time. I want to add one exciting thing there. I think there's also a lot of opportunity for universities to partner with nonprofits on this. I just saw um, an awesome nonprofit called Global Citizen Year announced they usually do gap years for students um, and send them abroad for a year of learning through public service and leadership and community engagement. They are they obviously paused their abroad program. They're now doing a fully virtual kind of like life skills um, and like leadership skills training next year. If if universities can partner with organizations like that, um, they they're better able to keep those students connected um, and doing something that feels interesting and meaningful to them, uh, which means they're 
probably likely that they will then matriculate in the following year uh, if, for example, as Jason, Jason said, they need to stay home to take care of family um, during this time of COVID. So, all right, well, I'll just say thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was really fun to talk through your questions and, um, you know, we just really appreciate your attention to this issue um, and stay tuned for more from us in the coming months.